Ah, there we are. <laughs> there he is. There he is. The magic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So why is it that that sometimes, like as a um, like as a computer IT guy in the past, yeah. right? You know, somebody yeah. offering support. Well, I, why? I still am. Yeah. Well, why is it? Why is it that that a simple restart? Like, what is the restart? I kind of know, but I mean, why is it so successful that a restart, uh, you know, can just flush out some of the, you know, the hangups? Um, well, this actually, I studied chemical engineering, so it's entropy. That's very simple. Yeah. Right? Right? <laughs> so, you know, basically, you know, everything is built on thermodynamics and your, uh -huh. you know, computer system is a, you know, system like anything else and a certain like mass and heat balance that's happening, hopefully not hopefully mass isn't accumulating inside your computer or anything, but heat might be. And mm -hmm. so turning it off might help with dissipating some of the heat. And also, you know, on a sort of more silicon, whatever sort of thing, like maybe some of the um, registers and everything shut down, right? Like you turn off and some um, persistent memories there, but some things like the computer has, like all, everything, all the calculations are done in registers essentially. And mm -hmm. so those, I think I'll get reset. I, I don't know. I've never, I haven't looked into this in depth. Maybe computers work totally differently now than they used to, but you know, it was it's fun to like learn how to like go in and do um, assembler at one point. I had this game that I got, um, civilizations, like, I don't know. Oh yes. I knew that one. Then. Three or something. Yeah, yeah. And I had it and somebody had um, run a hack on it. Uh -huh. And so like when you spent money, instead of it reducing the amount of money you had, it increased it. Huh. And so I had the game and I had the program they'd run to change the assembler um, so that this happened. And so I reversed engineered it. This was something I did one um, Christmas, actually. It was fun. I reverse engineered it to figure out how to undo the damage that was done and then get it a working version. Because I realized that if you didn't have enough money for to buy the thing, it, would, it, would do the, it wouldn't let you buy it. But if you had enough money, it would let you buy it and then increase the amount. So I was like, oh, okay. So I went and I found like the, the, the hack had the exact sort of position in the, in the code where it had changed, um, you know, a couple of uh, whatever bytes worth of, yeah, that's probably how it works. Yeah, um, yeah, what, whatever it was, I kept a couple of them. And then it was sort of going through and trying to make sense. And so I was able to look through and like use like some, you know, like how does, you know, assembler work, like what's a, you know, a jump code versus a this versus a that. It's amazing. It's, it's like super yeah. like logical, but at the same time, really, really nitty gritty detailed. And so I was able to see where it was doing the check to compare, do you have enough money? And that's the same sort of thing I need to do to say, like, um, go and decrement the money. Cause what yeah. it was doing is it was, it was had the space, like where it had been changed. It was like, there was um, like a null in there. Basically there's like a jump and a null or, or something. And so it'd be like, okay, we'll just skip past the thing where it decorates the money or something. I think it actually increased the money though. Oh, maybe it so, didn't. Yeah. So I don't a, know. You, anyway, you know, yeah. the term of null, null hypothesis, right? So it kind of sure, goes sure. into it. Yeah. So is this, is this would be like, um, uh, would this be similar to like an open circuit in a, in an, in electrical uh, language, do you think? You know, what, like what it's just not con connected. Like, I mean, because I know that that a null hypothesis is something that's, um, you know, it's just statistically insignificant. It's just of no value, right? Just kind oh, of. Oh well, but it is. So this this is the fun thing with those. So somebody posted this thing on one of these effective altruism Slack groups, talking about exactly this: that there was, you know, some sort of mental health thing, and there was the control, and there was an intervention, and it was statistically insignificant. So me being the idiot that I am, I was like, well, did they cost the same? Okay, all right. right? Like if it's a tenth of the cost, right? Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, then yeah. your null hypothesis is like, yes, this is proven that you can do the thing that's cost a tenth of a tenth of the money. And it's just as effective as the expensive one, which is kind of the way we normally think about things. We don't normally think in terms of like, is this hamburger as good as this chicken burger? Right, we're like, well, the chicken burger is yeah. slightly yeah, cheaper, yeah, 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 so I'll yeah, buy the chicken yeah. burger. Yeah, and I'll pretend like it's healthy. Oh, sorry, I saw Super Size Me too. Holy chicken, man, that's a good movie. <laughs> Everybody should watch that. One, it's entertainment. Two, you learn how to run a business. You learn wasn't what that, to was do. It, wasn't that a few years old? Is that the one that yeah, I'm thinking about? Ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That well, the Morgan Spurlock had this thing 14 year go, years ago. Super yeah. size me where he had. I like his technique. He he had like rules 
like I'm going to go to McDonald's and I'm going to order everything on the menu once. I can't order the same thing like twice in a whatever. And then if they asked him if he wanted to like upsize it or whatever it was, do you want fries with that? He then had to go for it. And yeah. then he went to different places in America and by, and like he, every time he went to Texas, apparently that's the only place where they consistently asked about upsizing. And yeah. so he ended up with the big, you know, drink, you know, whatever, and the fry, whatever. And so um, the, the great thing about the, the movie is so smart because like, the doctor that he had at the start was like, yeah, no problem. You should be fine. Like, you know, 30 days. You can, it's not great, but you should be okay. Halfway uh, through the doctor's like, look, you have to stop. You're at you risk of your stop. life. And that was to me, like the thing that stood out the most in suit, yeah. the original supersize me. Right. Yeah. So then like a couple of years ago, I guess. So 12 years after the original, he comes out with supersize me too. Holy chicken. And it's a whole different approach. He goes oh. and he decides to um, open a, a chicken restaurant. And it's absolutely genius because like, do you know what it requires for something to be called a um, um, free range chicken? Oh shit. All of that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh. But, and, and do you know who you, who, like how you, and so instead of just being a journalist, you, if as a business person, you go and you call the U S department of agriculture and you say, hi, I'm a chicken farmer. I have a, you know, and I'm going to sell and I'm doing this whole sort of farm to table thing. And then I'm going to have, I'm going to, I want to sell my chickens as free range chickens. What, what do I have to do? And it's like, oh, well, you know, they have to be able to get outside. It's like, okay. So, so do I have to take them outside in the middle of the day when it's hot? Well, no, they just need to have access to the outdoors 51% of the time when it's available or something. So they have a whole like, and so he's like, oh, okay. So they don't actually have to go outside. They just have to have access to go outside. And like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they don't have to be out be there in the hot weather because like they'll, they'll, you know, they'll die if it's too hot. And it's like, yeah, no, absolutely. They just have to have access to it. So I don't want to ruin it for you, but like it was really underwhelming what it required to be, a, a, you know, a free range chicken. Like it's not what you a consumer would think it is. And so he does an amazing job of like, instead of just showing you facts and figures, like actually showing you, you know, what this really looks like. And they do a really great job of making it come to life. And just like, yeah, now you're like, oh, when I hear the terms free range chicken, I know that's absolutely meaningless. Yeah. Just like, well, you know, hormone free is meaningless. Just like yeah. plutonium free chickens, not terribly meaningful. Most chickens don't have plutonium in them. You don't yeah. necessarily need to advertise your chickens as being free of plutonium because all chickens are free of plutonium. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't know, if, I didn't know whole... if you've eaten plutonium chickens before. They're not good for you. No, no, they, yeah. they apparently glow. So you can see in the freezer which ones are the <laughs> plutonium chickens. Well, I think that's the null house of us. We're going to try out. We've got some plutonium, <laughs> feed it some chickens. Let's see what happens. Hey, look, look, I know, I know we can be. So here's, here's the devil's advocate sort of yes. response to that is, is the fact that what are we talking about? We're talking about the conservatives coming to conservatives represent business and common sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Then okay. you've got the liberals and the people who want to make the rules. Yeah, yeah, I want to tell you. pretend that they're in charge. Something okay. like that. Yeah. I'm just pre I'm just playing, right? I'm just playing yeah, along yeah. with go, go, you know, yeah. this kind of thing. So yeah. so for all intents of intensive purposes, it's really great to have some guardrails there. Now, yeah. if if the conservative and the business owner says, oh, fuck it, I just need to put like a hole in a fence this big, and I can just let the chickens go out, you know, you know, once every two weeks when the auditor comes. I'm good, you know, and now I can put that all over my marketing and now I meet those criteria and all this bullshit. The problem is that's not very unifying because ultimately as yeah. a farmer, you know what is healthy for a chicken, right? You, you know, if I was going to make this the oh, most man. healthiest chicken that I could possibly make this. Oh, chicken, you wouldn't buy that breed of chicken though. Those chickens can't. So then you would, you would yeah. maybe start developing a cottage industry of Here's the variant of a chicken and here's oh, how it lives and here's the situation. But when you try and ram it through to a, like a catch all sort of rule, it's debilitating to business because the businesses are standing there scratching their heads going, this doesn't make sense. And now I'm just doing it because if I don't do it, I get no sales. Well, so, right? that's so the I have interesting to play part. in this, like in this swamp, I have to play well, in this contaminated environment. Right. Well, I'd say it's kind of like the, Sort, sort of like what you're saying, but it's more if you actually tried to do the right thing where you're like, okay, I want healthy chickens and they won't be these grotesque Franken chickens that grow like, you know, whatever. Have you seen like, the Hutterite chickens? Are you kidding me? They're huge. Well, uh, how I old think are those, they those, 
I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, maybe not like rapid. Because these ones were like six weeks old the, and they're massive, right? The breasts on these things, they're like the, the chicken must have had back problems. I'm telling you, like it's oh, like they're huge. Oh. They're enormous. They're like full of juice and they're like. The there sun- you go. And so, yeah, so there's examples. So the problem is, though, like if you um, have like this idea, like, oh, I'm going to have these healthy chickens. I'm not going to use this breed of like the fast growing ones. I'm going to use the slow growing chickens, the healthy, great lines. I'll read to them every night at bedtime, you know, so on and so forth. And then you go to the market and you're like, hey, these are healthy chickens. They were read to at night. Like they got to hang out with their family, you know, they're, 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 they're fed vegan food. That's actually a line from the movie. It's absolutely hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> So instead of the, the food being vegan, one of the chickens <laughs> vegan. One of the things that we have, though, we have to be able to talk without. <laughs> it's like a new language of like, can we cry and laugh at the same time? And how much can people understand what we're still saying? <laughs> no, absolutely. So, so anyway, the point was, um, though, if you if you were to do all that, and you're like, I have these super healthy, wonderful chickens. They've been treated so nicely. You know, they can use whatever pronouns they want, like whatever, all that <laughs> yeah, sort of yeah. stuff. Like you just go all in on woke chickens, right? And yeah. then like, of course you, you slaughter them humanely, which is important to do. No, I'm actually serious in this. Like Temple Grandin has a lot of done amazing work. She's a, you know, superstar in both the autistic community and also in the animal welfare community for like humanely killing animals, which like, you know, the animal should like live a life that is not full of suffering and pain. Like this is hopefully not controversial. That would be bad. And then okay. when you actually go to kill the animal, kill it in the cleanest. And a lot of tr- religions have some sort of concept of this, like halal yeah. or kosher or whatever has some sort of like killing the animal process. So, so that's cool. And then, yeah. but if you did that, if you're like, okay, I'm going to do these chickens, we can do all this nice thing. And then I'm going to, you know, I go be able to get to the sauna and go to the beach and like, you know, fly them to Hawaii and stuff like that. Then when you go to sell your chicken burger, it's like, yeah, here's a $50 chicken burger. And someone's like, huh, does it taste amazing? No, it actually tastes pretty terrible. <laughs> it's just the chickens had a great life. You're like, yeah, I don't know. And I think the market would decide. I think the market would be like, yeah, people aren't going to buy that. And the reason I say that is in his movie, Super Size Me 2, Holy Chicken. I'm like basically advertising the movie here. I should get paid by Morgan Spurlock. We should have him on as a guest, maybe. Um, he like demonstrates how like consumers aren't buying the grilled chicken. They're buying the fried chicken. Well, they don't call it fried chicken. They call it crispy because that's smart. Um, but pe- nobody wants to buy the grilled one, the healthy one, because it doesn't yeah. taste like And so like the same sort of thing. So it was genius. He went and he made it like a really, really great tasting chicken sandwich. And then just demonstrate all the like, you know, the what's that you you would know the, the book about um, the Chicago meatpacking thing, the jungle oh. that was called. Well, there was one. The, the book that comes to my mind was Kitchen Con- Confidential. I know it's not related entirely, oh. but it is about okay. and all the restaurants that drop all that shit on the floor and how shit goes back. You know, it's just like if you knew what happened in the kitchen, you wouldn't want to go to the restaurant. <laughs> oh, okay. Right? Interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a take for, a, for a, you know, totally transparent kitchen is like, oh, by the way, we do actually put shit in your food. You probably get shut down by the health inspectors. So that might be a bad business model, but yeah, essentially like, I think we're, we're, we're basically saying the same thing is that if you play by the rules, not necessarily not if you play by the rules, if you go all in and you try to make an amazing thing, that's wonderful and great. Maybe like, consumers aren't actually willing to pay for it yeah yeah well right? and yeah. you know and i'm thinking we we you know we've we've yapped about this before oh shit i mean you know what's going to happen is that if climate change is real look i'm playing in the i'm playing in the reality of you know i'm, I'm understanding who the audience is i understand you know where you're coming from yeah mostly, i, think, I right? think climate change is real so we can agree on that climate yeah so change that's is real. kind of that's a that's an odd way to insert or start you know start the conversation but okay. i think that how we're i think what what would be more reflective of what you would be thinking is that um, the the liberal response to what we do about it is not what is real or what well, you know. I've got a, a great example for if you want like a okay, liberal yeah. sort of. Well, it's more like an NDP thing, but you know whatever. Mm-hmm. Toronto City Council is looking at um, banning banning mm-hmm. um, micro um, um, utility drones, like um, like so essentially like little delivery vehicles, like small little things that are on mm-hmm. side. They look cute, whatever, and they move along sidewalks and deliver things to people. And so they're they're um apparently went through some, you know, with a disability um 
coalition or whatever and then they came up with like oh we should just ban these things and like i'm a big advocate for disability rights i am really really curious to understand and banning might be the right thing to do because i don't i haven't looked into it um but i'm curious as to like how this would actually be um useful to ban something then how are you actually going to create a solution that works right if you say hey we're going to outright ban like little autonomous um you know delivery vehicles or whatever and then you say, well, because they're, you know, they're bad for people like in wheelchairs or people with like, you know, um, who have um, partial vision, you know, um, partial vision, vision or seeing eye dogs or whatever, all the, all the sort of reasons you, you might claim that you're doing it. But then it becomes like, well, so, then, so now that you've banned it and let's say you're successful with that. So what, what like, we're just going to like wait and hope someone else somewhere innovates and comes up with like something that'll work. And then they'll yeah. develop it in like Phoenix, Arizona. And they'll come here and I'll be like, yeah, that's great, but it doesn't work for the snow. Yeah. Look, you've said a lot there, honestly. Yeah. And, and, and let's, let's look at that, um, that initial, uh, you know, concept of, and I, I'm not familiar with it because I haven't, I, I was in a, I was in a hotel in Montreal a year and a half ago and they had a little robot that would go to the, you know, would go to the individual suites. Jeez. It would deliver like a, pop or a coke or water or food or so i don't know i didn't use it but i see that i saw the little thing moving around right so this is the idea is that that a um uh in, in you know for for the purposes of of like um universal access uh you know you have people that are in wheelchairs that are saying hey wait a minute we don't really like this this, this doesn't work for us because we have these you know things that can be coming at us and they won't stop or they won't move out of the way off the road or is that kind of the idea well so that's just the challenge is it's not clear so i tried to read through and i didn't spend a lot of time on it because like you know it's like well you know what are you going to do with your life are you going to spend it trying to read legal documents or whatever so i tried to look at like the rationale for banning them and i wasn't able to see anything other than they just recommended they should ban them and there wasn't like a clear example of like what it was exactly they were concerned of so it would be really useful to understand that so instead of like the way i'm thinking of it, instead of just like um we talk to some people with disabilities and they don't like them or, or whatever. And then ban, it's kind of like, why don't we get the specific rationale? Like, okay, so someone in a wheelchair, they are yeah. concerned that this is going to get under their wheel or do some sort of, it's like, okay, so that's one okay. Mm -hmm. thing. Okay. Someone with a walker. Okay. There are concerns that someone with a cane, it's like, okay. And like, maybe the thing will hit it and they'll slip and fall. It's like, okay. So, so, okay. That's, that's good to gather so far. Now let's talk about slips and falls and like people in wheelchairs and other things like, are you having problems now, even without these utility vehicles, if we banned them, would you still have problems where things get caught under your wheels or like your walker thing, you know, you, yeah. you, you fall over with your can and it's like, oh yes, if it's icy outside, you know, sometimes like I have a cane and then like I slipped and I've, I've broken my hip because it's icy outside. It's like, oh, okay. So it's not necessarily that this thing is causing that you're concerned this might make that worse. But like maybe there's like a little micro um, utility thing that could drive around and salt sidewalks. Yeah, yeah. And that might yeah. actually be a good use. And maybe yeah. it runs at like four in the morning or something with not people out and it does the salting. And then that way people who have, you know, limited mobility or, you know, wearing, using a cane or a walker or something, it's not actually making their lives better. It's like, yeah. okay, so, so instead of an outright ban, can we say like, what if we focus on the use of these things, you know, with put in like, let's aim to make people's lives better. And so let's make sure there's something there to say like, okay, these things delivering um, salt for sidewalks or whatever, maybe that's a really, really great example that everybody from both the disability community and also the people who are really in technology enthusiasts for these things can agree on. Like, that's a great thing to have. Make those mm -hmm. things go, have them go at four in the morning. Okay, great. Okay, so instead of the city outright banning it and like, you know, driving innovation to a halt, like maybe we can say that that's something that like, you know, we would allow. And we'd say, yes, absolutely. It's okay, great. What else mm -hmm. is there? Okay, the thing with the wheelchairs and maybe it gets stuck in. Okay, like, you know, if you are designing those things, can you make it so that they avoid wheelchairs in some way? Can you have some sort of sensors in there? Can you, you know, is that something you can do? It's like, well, that would cost us money. Like, okay, well, how much would it cost? How can we get funding for it? You know, the city's not necessarily going to pay for it. You know, can the province or the federal government pay for it? Is there like some, you know, um, 
I don't know, charity out there or some sort of, you know, some other thing. Like, you know, let's just kind of go through these things one at a time and really figure out like at the very, very granular detailed level, like what are the problems and then what are the potential solutions and just sort of do the sort of, you know, like the, this is a really, really great right, right, way to drive innovation forward. Like mm -hmm. a ban just puts it to a complete halt versus going through and dealing with the really, really nitty gritty details, which politicians don't like to do. So I understand this is not in the politician's toolkit, but you could create, you know, legislation. You could create laws that say, okay, oh. you're allowed to use these things. <laughs> You're, like you're allowed to use these things <laughs> we're and, leaning way over to stupidity over here yeah okay, like you're ahead. allowed to use these things and and here's and here's the sort of like you know instead of an outright ban like here's kind of the way to structure it and you could even have incentives and stuff built into it and like whatever would make the most sense to make it work but make it like market-based solutions like Look, most I, i'm totally for market-based yeah. solutions yeah. okay Okay, cool. I, 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 I totally think this is amazing. And I, I, uh, but the problem is, and I want to give a, I want to give an example of some real, real stupidity. I think we were last time we jumped off, I was going to get into the Bifama homes. Right. Yeah. But I want to say, I want to talk about a very serious disaster that's happened in my neck of the woods. Okay. All right. So they're, they're saying it's, um, like, I mean, it's a climate issue. It has to do with, uh, you know, increased weather events and such. But in the valley where I live, um, like I live on an island, Vancouver Island. Okay. Now on the Was mainland. Was it always an island or did this yes. adverse weather event make it? <laughs> well, I can't say about like, you know, when the, the Beringian land bridge was in place. I haven't looked <laughs> okay, it up sure. on Google Maps at that point, okay, but okay. it pretty much is, yeah, you have to swim to get to Vancouver. So <laughs> I'll take your word for it. I haven't been there. I'll take your word for it. And, and so, so you have um, the lower mainland and in the valley, like going inland, going mm. east in, in the valley, an entire city got washed out. But I don't watch oh. the news, so this is new to me. Like you, you are Peter Mansbridge to me here. Yes. So it's, it's Abbott's mission. The whole Trans Canada Highway just got wiped off the map. Uh, you know, it, it, it's been, you know, cleared or whatever, and it's going to be, but this is like military grade response at this particular point. We are talking wow. about bridges and roads and transportation systems are being affected. You need a military grade response. That's my position on climate change, right? However, okay. authoritarian the consequences may be, right? Okay. But my issue, my issue here is that you have an entire, um, valley which is it got a lot of farming on it right mm. so like there's horses and chickens and cows and all sorts of stuff right and you have that proprietor that market driven person that you know they decide hey we're going to start selling chickens now chances are they've had family members that do it and this type of thing and anyways they've got this this is the industry that's supporting food and agriculture locally where we're at in a big way in a really big way yeah, yeah. So what happens is that the whole thing, and now it's like, oh, we want the government to help. Okay, so what do you want the government to help? Oh, well, we'll give you two thousand dollars and a, you know, the, the phone number to the Red Cross. Dude, we're talking about your entire livelihood got wiped away. Hmm. Okay, entirely lively, their entire livelihood plus the animals and the suffering of the there's like you know dead animals yeah. floating around, all this kind of thing, right? So where I say. You know, I mean, you know, just like in an argument and go to first principles, I say, wait a minute, why don't we go to um, how did this get approved? This is the watchword approval regulations. Libertarian goes ah, anathema. I don't want to hear that. But you know what? They failed. They all failed. Because the engineers um, should never allow a house to be built there because of like it's built in a place where it oh. will flood. So, so how old is the ho housing stock there? Like how long ago were they built? Oh, there's, there's housing that, that could be there for like 50, 60, I think maybe even hundred years, maybe. Yeah. So, so back then, did, was it like, oh yeah, no, this, this seems reasonably like fine. You build here. No worries about floods. Well, basically what they had to do in order to transform the land is they actually had to build dikes and then drain. It was a, it was like a, a big, huge, um, Holland pond or like or water body or and stuff like that. one of those yeah, countries I, yeah it was like it, that yeah exactly so yeah. so they had to make those decisions now 
I, I wouldn't point to the person just at the turn of the century that built the, you know, the 1920s, like beautiful Victorian like that. That's, that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about people's in the eight people in the eighties, nineties, uh, you know, two thousands, 2010s that go to apply for business and the permit and the regulatory bodies from the city, the municipality, the province, the code, all the engineers and the architects, the ones that are supposed to understand this. If you mm -hmm. and I go to book, look at a property and we're like, oh, there's dikes here, there's this, that, and blah, blah, blah. I am a proprietor. I buy the property and I'm like, can I build this, Mr. Architect? Can I build it, engineer? Mm -hmm. You're the expert, right? Okay. Yeah. They're going to say, yeah, you can do that. No problem. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not in, in any, you know, major catastrophe, like risk or anything. Well, let me, let me, let me really make sure. What about the insurance companies? Oh yeah. Yeah. We'll give you insurance. No problem. No, no problem. Yeah. No risk. No issue. Right. Gone. Wait, this is so, a so, failure of regulations. Wait, wait. So, so what happened then when somebody like that happened, they went to their insurance company and the insurance company was like, oh yeah, it turns out we're not paying for that or. I'm, I'm talking too broad brushstroke here. I'm oh, thinking okay. that the, the insurance companies are probably going to, you know, um, you know, you know, pay based off the depth of their, uh, you know, their policies. I don't know if it's a shitty situation. And then the farmers had to say, I just can't get insurance or to what degree they're insured. Again, this is all personal. Um, you know, this is all personal choice, but what is not personal choice is to understand that, it's in a place that can flood and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that, that this could flood. And we knew, we knew about this in the seventies, right? We knew about this. And okay. so for every municipality or any government body that allows for this type of thing, this is horrendous. This is, this destroys the, you know, the average working per, working person, uh, you know, innovation, you know, these are all, farmers and entrepreneurs and people that just say, hey, what are the rules? I'll play by the rules and I'll let the mark. So what are the well, rules? Like, yeah, I'm, the not, rules I'm not sure. The rules like, are not good. Like, it sounds like the market was potentially a bit distorted there, especially if the insurance became like, you know, subject to some sort of government subsidy or something, because there's a lot of incentives to make business happen somewhere even if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? So there's a lot of kind of yeah. like, oh, you know, politicians get reelected based on jobs. So like, well, what can we do to create jobs here? And you can create jobs by doing a whole lot of things which aren't necessarily great economically and certainly exactly. not great environmentally. And this yeah. sounds like this may have been one of those things where like everybody kind of like conspired together to say like, yeah, well, it's not like, well, it's not maybe not the best place to build stuff, but other people are doing it. So I guess, you know, it's kind of like, peer pressure, social proof that it's like, well, it can't be that bad to build here because that guy over there has a house and he's an engineer. He wouldn't be here if it was yeah. bad, right? And it's like, yeah. you know, your doctor, you know, four out of five doctors recommend you shouldn't smoke or whatever. Well, there's one who thinks it's fine. So like, you know, the doctor who's smoking or, you know, whatever, the, the anti-vax, you know, nurses or whatever, there's always going to be somebody who's like, wanting to like not follow along with other people are doing and that can be good like in those cases smoking is bad for you you should probably get the covid vaccine covid sucks um but in something like that it's the dynamics kind of flipped around where the weirdos the ones who are like running around like you would be like hey but there's dikes there in this you guys shouldn't build here so and like everybody's like daniel calm down man don't get hysterical it's fine and then they yeah. just they would go and find all the evidence they possibly could to yeah. confirm what they already believe and ignore anything that disputes it. And, yeah, the, and the, true, yeah. the, the place that I see this happening the most is with yeah. people who call themselves rationalists. Hmm. And they, Which, they know about confirmation bias and they go yeah. and do this sort of thing. Yeah. 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 You're, you know, you're, you're damned if you do and you're damned if people like a good train wreck. And so, you know, I guess, but I just, I don't know. I feel it so unnecessary and i see some sort of thing happening well in um, a way feel... it's necessary it is it's necessary well well not not necessarily for the specific people and stuff like that. that that's bad for them and they should you know get you know i don't like seeing anybody suffer but like the the theory i go with i call it the titanic theory of change management and you mm -hmm. could have argued well we should put life vests and lifeboats on ships and blah 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 and you could have argued that for years and you know people would have ignored you and been like okay yeah yeah whatever and then you know the biggest 
most powerful ship in the world sinks and it didn't have enough lifeboats on it. And like, then it becomes obvious like, oh, well, I guess we should do that because now we can point to that and be like, oh, well, of course we're going to spend the money to do that. And of course, we're going to pass the laws and stuff for, for health and safety and stuff, because looks what look what happens when we don't, right? It's kind of like anybody working on pandemic preparedness these days. It's like, yeah, like in a way, it's kind of easy to say, well, we got to prepare for the next pandemic. This is true, um, but like it's so much more valuable if you could possibly mm -hmm. convince people to prepare for the next disaster that we don't already have an example of. And, you know, this yeah. is where like within effective altruism, they talk about long-termism and existential risk and like maybe AI will kill us or something, who knows? But the ones that have already happened, it's like, oh, a pandemic happened and now we're cool, we're, we're ready for that. We're like ready to like figure out how to deal with the next one. Climate change, we can see happening. You've got, you know, places flooding, the whole continent of Australia was on fire. It's, I'm probably mm -hmm. exaggerating, but you know, whatever, wildfires. And so like, in a way, those things are kind of almost somewhat necessary and, it, and in a way, it's maybe better they hap so, happen sooner rather than later, because one of the problems with climate change is things get baked in. So it's like if we start to change things now, then like maybe the climate doesn't respond for a couple of decades. So I, I don't know, like I'm not like, I don't firmly know exactly what the best way to proceed with any of the stuff is, but it's tricky because there's a lot of that decisions that were made be made in the past and we haven't necessarily changed the way decisions get get made i love right. how your screen's kind of like doing i don't know why it's uh yeah i want it to to be on on manual not um, i think it's the water auto focus you're, right you're like riding the waves and <laughs> over there and stuff yeah. so the um the the what are their names the ones with the prefab housing and stuff what was that called oh Bifama homes yeah, yeah i'd love to talk about that for a little yeah. while yeah. um so i look they look kind of cool i wasn't clear what the pricing is for them versus some other um be a regular traditional option is it you can move those in case of a flood is that what's good about them that's like the partly Noah, yeah Noah's partly what's good of, about them yeah. okay yeah um i so the, the here's kind of the story in the background about how how it developed um let me just the sun's going through here wow sunlight jeez it's like somebody's in, somebody's in vancouver and bragging about having too much sun Okay, hold on a sec. I'll turn the light on. <laughs> that made the difference. All right. Yes, so Bafama Homes. So, yeah, maybe I should share the screen. It gives a little bit of um, yeah, sure. context here. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so, yeah, let's do this one. And let's take it off of my calendar. <laughs> and let's good. put it into bfamahomes.com. All right. So where we actually, we started this, I've been, you know, cause I have, I have a consulting company in the, in, in architecture and uh, uh, construction industry. So I do, I do some, some work consulting on big data. And this is where I've kind of grown from as a, a manufacturer's rep, okay? So um, one of the, the clients that I've had for you know, more than a decade is this uh, company called PanelX. Now they're mm -hmm. a company uh, in Vancouver, in Richmond in particular, um, on the Pacific coast of Canada. And they do a lot of really high-end homes, okay? So they would work with, um, how can my, I almost see my screen doesn't seem to be sharing here probably. Anyways, um, so we would work homes that were about 500 to $1,500 a square foot build cost, right? And so wow, these are multi, multi-million dollar homes because we have some of the most expensive real estate in all the world, actually, in, in, in West Vancouver, for example. Really? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an absolute beautiful place to live. And it's it's interesting because it's on that Pacific coast. I mean, it's right on the ocean. We've got like warm ocean currents. We've got fairly mild climate until we had 
um, like we don't get the deep freeze because we've got this like warm ocean current coming off of the coast. Okay. Now, so for Canada, we've got very yeah. mild climate. Yeah, basically right? the most hospitable place in Canada in February. Exactly. Yeah. It probably says that on the signs when you arrive there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so we've got in our license plates, beautiful British Columbia, maybe, <laughs> you know, I don't know. So it is, it's a very, I don't know what ours say open for business. Maybe I don't remember. I think they changed them and made them blue and then the pandemic hit and that became irrelevant, but yeah, go on. Sorry. And over and I'll show you. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, we have, we have, We've been working in these this kind of environment, and this particular manufacturer has a light metal fabrication facility, right? Because yes. like PPG paint lines, he has all the kind of stuff to put the real premium stuff on homes. So this is the quality, quality, quality sort of niche. I actually know what that thing is called at the top. Open web steel joists up at the top there. Oh, that's fascinating. Yes, that yeah. image. WSJs. Yeah, those are all pre-engineered. Um, and so if a builder or a do it yourself or the one on the right is called longhouse and that's a kit mm -hmm. kind of right. The one on the, on the, or sorry, the one on the left is all done. Everything's move-in ready. The one on the right is more of a kit. Mm. So in construction, we talk about lockup. And so the one on the right, the longhouse can get you to lockup. Okay. And so builder can sorry, use it. Lockup mean it's like substantial completion or. No, the, it's without the. So it has all the exterior building envelope and everything's all kind of good to go, right? Okay. okay. Um, uh, substantial so complete. So it's enclosed. So you get it and it's enclosed and then you can do the indoors without having to worry about weather. That's the, it, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. Yeah, substantial, that yeah, it's not that, okay. Yeah, and then, you know, you're putting in your cabinets and this and that, and, you know, you're putting your furnace in and everything. Lockup just means that it's protected from the elements. Mm. Okay. okay, so it's got a proper building envelope and this kind of thing. Okay, nice. so the inspectors come around and they check all this. So what he's done in a factory is be able to provide something that can be barged somewhere, shipped, comes in a package, and you're you know you're, you're right you, the, to point out these, um, you know the, this this pre-engineered structure, those open web joists, those are steel, Beautiful. they're pre-engineered, um, and they allow for this height, mm -hmm. right? And so. You can see in that one picture, there's like a suspended bedroom up there. And so yeah. you could have like a 600 square foot home, 800 square foot home, really open, have a suspended bedroom, go put it on the cottage, this kind of thing. That that That's kind of what that's for. How do you have any privacy? Because you have like curtain wall there, like you do in an office tower. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, see, because he's he has a curtain wall system, he developed the curtain wall system and yeah. glass is pretty much a commodity, at least the sealed units, yeah. the the sides uh, either being metal or wood or actually, I should clarify, the sides can't actually be wood on the building, but the metal can actually be the side. Um, and you can actually change it so that it's not transparent anymore. Oh, okay. And you could yeah. put like decorative wood on the side. It's more of a facade, but it's right, a facade right. on a facade, but you don't have to have it all open glass. Yeah, that may be bad if you wanted to like, I don't know, have a bathroom in there or something. Well, it depends. Oh, did you hear that? There's like a joke from E.O. Wilson a long time ago, and he was trying to gather momentum with his environmentalists, um, okay. and, you know, and um, he said, well, we can't call them naturalists because that means you walk around with no clothes on. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Right? It's the same thing here. You know, you can't, it's just you know you could be an exhibitionist and have like your house out in the woods and you don't really care if the bear is watching you taking a dump you know what i'm saying <laughs> sorry to be crude but you know well, that i mean yeah it's just like a lot of times people get nice fancy things and they spend a lot of money to have a place that they can invite other people over to so they can brag about like you know how awesome their place is and, and i hope you put solar panels on the roof because certainly you're going to want to brag about having those well, you know, not out of the factory, but you definitely can put them on. It's it's hard sure. as somebody, you know, trying to offer a product to say mm. it includes this solar panel, it includes that. Yeah. We don't know where it is, where it's situated. Um, you know, so, you know, for, you know, you got to really kind of make, you can't be everything to all people, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So there's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's exciting. So, yeah. yeah. So this is really, so how, um, how does it compare to the traditional building costs? Is it roughly the same, more expensive, a little cheaper? Um, I would, okay, yeah, so here's how the story went. So I told you when 
you know, when we were working, we're doing a lot of the high end stuff and our facades that we would do and put on high end homes. Um, and I'll put a I'll put a little video in in this video. OK, mm -hmm. I'll show you, you know, what 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 I typically do or how how this company typically interacts in the in in the market here. Um, we thought, well, what if we used all of the high quality products and procedures and methodology and we, we just tried to make a smaller home, right? Hmm. So we did that and we came up to $400 approximately a square foot. So the unit on um, the right, for example, would, mm, I think it's a smaller, some, that might be about, say, to 300,000, right? 250 to 300,000 for one of those units. And it's probably about a thousand square feet. And that's just for the building materials, not the land. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and so the other way to look at it is what you call stick framing. And so that's when you just buy lumber from the lumber store and you go out and you just like hammer two by fours together and you just build your house. Okay. Mm. So in that situation, you're probably looking, you couldn't build that for that price. It's just not possible with the spans and everything else. Of course, you could build one that's not so tall and you could build one that, but you know, we're trying to come at the market with something innovative that has that high space. If we're gonna try to have more efficient buildings, mm. we feel that something with more voluminous sort of, instead of having a larger footprint, you have larger mm. space it does something in the environment. And uh, I think people can live in a smaller footprint, be more energy efficient. Yeah, just, just so I have a, like yeah. a, a comparison. So I, I work at Giffel's Design Build at a payment administration and contract payment certification and contract administration, um, not for very long. It was interesting, but I seem to remember warehouses was that they did built a lot of, and they were somewhere around $100 a square foot. Um, mm -hmm. I don't imagine that same price point is the way things are today. Like what, what does a warehouse cost? You know, in terms of construction costs. That's probably about, I guess, I don't know, maybe about right, but you got to think a yeah, warehouse okay. is all about large square footage. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And so when you shrink it down to say 400 square feet with the bare essentials, you're putting in, you know, toilets and, and, yeah, yeah. and you're there's economies in... of scale, right? Like exactly. you have a big warehouse and Nick, you have exactly. a couple of washrooms for like 50 people or right. Well, yeah. Who, who knows what people do out there, what big, companies do like hopefully they do provide washrooms you know it's probably required by law but who knows maybe they're trying to be more efficient they're like no no you don't need to use the wash maybe the, they put the washroom outside and then they charge you to use it um, yeah you know who knows like may, maybe don't do that maybe be a good employer but anyway yeah um okay cool so like so yeah so small is beautiful but it sounds like small is also expensive but it's but that's I think we're missing the point, though. I mean, this is definitely that small is is this is on the higher end of of the scale in terms of quality. But I don't think it's unreachable because we were surprised ourselves to say if we put all the best products into something, we're coming in around four or five hundred dollars a square foot. To right. be quite honest, Alex, I recommend as a marketing guy to sell it for eight or nine hundred dollars a square foot. And the reason yeah. is, is because it's very hard to improve on something that is so good, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. if, if, if Tesla's bill of materials came in at $20,000 a car, but they thought, hey, we'll have no way to market it, we'll have no way to promote it, we'll have no way to drive incentive into the market for it to be you know, disseminated by dealers and all that sort of stuff. Well, this is a very intense, uh, I guess, no, not intangible, it's a tangible, intangible. It's, it's, it's part of the, of, of the planning that you have to think about as a business owner, right? Like I may have the best product in the world, but if I got a zero marketing budget and no incentive for yeah, a distribution, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we have a bit of a problem. So yeah. it, it's not just the cost of the individual units. It's like, how am I going to, um, how am I going to get it out there? Yeah. Sorry. I guess I'm, I guess I'm, I'm looking at sort of the, um, you know, housing is expensive one of the reasons for it is the cost of land another reason is the cost of construction and exactly. maybe perhaps there's um, a regulation cost yeah you know yep. if you're not allowed to build in certain areas then it now becomes and you have to like if you're a developer and you have to go through all kinds of hoops and you have to go through planning committee and this that and the other, like like nothing's free, right? And and this is like like the the annoying thing with a lot of regulations and laws is that it sort of just assumes 
that you can pass laws saying this must be done or that must be done. And then, you know, because the government's not paying out of their pocket, it's like no big deal that somebody else has to pay for it or whatever, right? Exactly. And, and now I'm going to, de- yeah. yeah, I'm going to default to Taleb and say, put skin in the game. How okay. do your regulators actually have to actually work with the community? Okay. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at this manufacturer. He's got $10 million in property and assets to produce this. And he's, listen, we're listening to CBC. This is, well, you, it's your CBC as well. Um, you know, coast to coast, it's our national um, network for media, right? Okay. And there's housing issues all over the place. I'm like, well, then, hey, we can make them right here. Oh, you know, politicians, housing concern, housing concern. We need money. I'm like, well, we can make it right here. All you just have to do is write a check. Keep in mind, politicians do do well with issues that can't be solved. That's right. Right. Or, you know, but it's not just the politicians. If you go to the, you know, to the, you know, municipal authorities and they'll be like, yeah, that's a great product. I'm like, okay, now can you let everybody know? Whoa, hey, no, no, we don't do that. Oh my gosh. Can you endorse it? No, 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 we can't do that. Titty. Uh, Yeah, but we can't have, come on, man. Like I'm I'm being very progressive here as a conservative saying, why not? You know, you have the industry coming back, trying to make the best product that they can for social good. But yeah, there's so the, no. It, it's fascinating because the government sets up a lot of programs that do, you know, kind of silly things, right? Like, um, you know, there was, uh, I was at a call earlier and they're talking about like a, you know, credit union where they wanted to lend money for something that, you know, would have been good for an environment, you know, for environmental reasons, but they're not allowed to because of, you know, financial risk or whatever. It's too risky a thing. Um, and it's like, well, if this one regulator and this other regulator actually talk to each other and you said, well, OK, we this is a bit more risky financially, but ha- delivers social benefits or environmental benefits or whatever. Maybe we you know, sort of do a blended sort of score. We do a trade off and like instead of you have to, you know, because because the problem with regulation, a lot of times it's like each of these things is a silo. So you have to pass yeah. this regulation, this one, this one. And it doesn't matter that you got like an A plus on the environmental and social one, if you didn't get like a passing grade on the the financial risk one, right? So like, we're not incentivizing like the best possible um, things out there because the regulator, they're not paying any sort of market price. There's no, they're just like, there's a bar that has to be passed. And so people just try to pass it. And that can be, you know, doing the right thing, you know, and doing an amazing job and making some, some superior product, or it could be, you know, your um, you know, chickens that get to roam in a small amount of space. Yeah. You know that could be it, and it's like, oh yeah, they're uh, you know, they're free range chickens. But what yeah, does that yeah. even mean? Maybe it doesn't mean anything. And so it's the same sort. It's all it's all like the same sort of thing in terms of like regulation is a really blunt instrument. And so, like, I'm not opposed to regulation. I'm just opposed to like I'd say stupid regulations. I like stupidity. I think smart yeah. regulations are the ones to oppose. Like when somebody calls something smart, they're obviously hiding something. Like smart goals. Have you ever heard those? They're not very good. Or the marketing for smart water. I don't know. Measurable, I mean, attainable, risk, realistic, and timely. And like I worked somewhere and they were supposed to provide an example of those. And the example they gave wasn't a smart goal. And it's well, like, let, let me show you one more thing and then I'll pull the, I'll pull the site down or the, yeah, yeah, the no image worries. down. Hey. So you see how this this particular house it's sitting out on a floodplain, flood right? Yeah. Did you catch this when you looked at the site? Well, when you showed me this picture, I noticed it. I was like, wait a second, that looks like water right next to it. Yeah. So normally, what would happen is if a developer wanted to develop this, they'd have to do a ton of back, um, like they'd have to take a backfill, is what they call it. So they'd have to do like thousands of truckloads of of dirt into here so that they could actually build a subdivision, right? Okay. So this raises up. So you don't have to terraform the land. Wow. Um, and you've got an articulating foundation here. Wow. So flipping, we're high tech. We're not trying to build a house that's going to change and everybody's going to live in one of these houses. This is very specific, high tech sort of housing, right? Special use case. It's purpose built. Then we have another one that will turn with the sun, with the orientation of the sun, right? 
um, a security purpose, you could actually take these. And the reason why you have a, a platform on the snowy condition is because it won't naturally lift up if it snows. You have to mechanically raise it. But if you have a place up north or in a cabin that you don't want to have, Ontario's an example of this. There's so many um, cottages and stuff like that. Well, you imagine you, you leave your cottage and then you just hit a remote control button and it goes you know, 10, 15 feet in the air. I mean, it's secure. You have a camera underneath the thing. You can see anything that comes near the thing, right? So you're not going to have it. It's like this new level of, of protection or security possibly, right? Yeah, I don't know. Why would why not just leave it on the ground? I... Well, I'm look. I'm I don't know how people will use this, right? No. Other than the fact that you know what we're showing here is if there's dramatic snowfall, you can raise it. It's just a an idea of like you know because you could use these in a uh, a dramatic snowfall sort of situation. It could be up on a ski hill, and you could just dial the height of the building into you know based on the snowpack. You know what I'm saying? Can you can you make it move up and down while you're inside? That sounds like fun. Yeah, we can do anything. Oh, wow. You know? So you could have like the, it set to like changing the height, moving it up and down in line with some music and stuff. So you could actually take that <laughs> and make it into like, you, you know, just have a limit of beats per minute. Really. You can't yeah. be very fast. Otherwise, well, you, know, you could you could make that into like, you know, just like an amazing <laughs> sort of entertainment platform where people come in. It could be like a little mini club and people come in and they go and like the music's playing and the thing moves up and like, you know, you have your drinks yeah, or I mean, whatever, and then like the thing moves down and people get out and they go off to the next one or whatever. Okay, and I'm imagining this whole, this whole community yeah. and you've ah. got them all coming up and down, right? Like they're yeah. all sort of like moving to like the, that, that would be cool. That would be that, really yeah. cool. Yeah, and people, you know, you could, on New Year's or whatever, people like to go out and party and stuff. And what better way to celebrate the New Year by the thing raises to the top. And then as they drop the ball in wherever, New York or whatever, you could have the thing drop as well. And you there hit you the go, bottom yeah. and there you go. New, happy yeah. New Year. All sorts of stuff. Because we've got that structural integrity in, in you know, how to build it. So now it's just proper engineering, right? And so, oh, like articulating it to face the sun, right? You can have it, can, so you could have like a, a nice morning sunrise and then, you know, through the day, you know, it's moving and it's moving and then you experience the sunlight, the sunset. Genius. You know, um, I guess like you'd have to make sure that like as it's moving up and down and turn, you don't hit anybody or anything. I'm sure there's a way to do that. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that has to be thought of, right. But it's sort of important. It's, it's, it's fun. It's fun yeah, oh, to work at it's... this level. And I can say firsthand that it is very difficult to get these into the market because you don't have the support from your regulators. You don't have the support from your professionals. If I show this to another professional, are they gonna promote it? Are they gonna share it with their friends? Well, no, because no. mostly it's not their product. Yeah, and yeah. So but, that, but that's no different than anything else in the marketplace, is it? Well, what I'm saying is, is that I think that this was developed in a in a response to the housing crisis to solve social need so we're okay. saying okay hey guys there's this big panic right okay well we've got a 10 million dollar facility let's go and make all this stuff and now okay there's a big problem so you know i'm assuming there's going to wow. be people to buy it right well let's let's start you having know? these conversations with so i was at an event for impact united um and they had the canada morgan housing corporation there and they were yeah. talking about all these things. And so let's start exploring this. Let's look at things yeah. like, I don't know, social impact bonds or some sort of impact investing or something where, you know, yeah, if the market isn't doing it, given the current instruments that are available, maybe there's some way. Like, so if somebody was to buy, so instead of just think of that, that as the product, the thing the person's buying is um, housing. So, you know, you can buy housing as, you know, a property that you own, or you can buy it, yeah. you know, through rental or whatever. So if it's a property that you own, you need the land, you need the building, and then you need financing, right? Yep. And so like, if you package all that up in like a way that'll work, then maybe this becomes sort of like a thing that um, some sort of investment entity can put in their portfolio, right. where it's like, okay, if you have these things and you can do the financing properly, maybe you can sell these to people and be like, hey, for whatever, a million, two million, five million, I have no idea the price of land in Vancouver there, but somewhere you could say like, this is how much these go for it fully, you know, you've, you've 
secured the land, you've you've done whatever the, the preparation, which sounds like is minimal. You've got all the approvals. You, got, you Basically, you have the whole thing ready to go. Um, yeah. But the thing to do, it would not be on like a one off. It's like, oh, you want one of these. Now we have to go through this, you know, land, this approval thing here. and We have to do this. It would be doing that as like a, oh, for the this entire area, like this entire giant whatever area, we work with the property owner and then we work with other regulators. But if we want to build one of these anywhere in this area, then we it's pre-approved. It's ready to go. It's pre-approved from an environmental thing yeah. and can be pre-approved from the financing, the mortgage part. Like if you could package up something like that, then I don't know. I, I, do. Would be I have it. Oh, okay, I cool. So yeah, then what, yeah, what's got, the price got, point? Like, so someone's like, okay, I want to buy one of these. Like, what, what are they paying? You're looking at about between four and $500 a square foot. And okay. yeah. And so, um, but you know, for the construction and then place the land, but I don't know whether your land is on Pender Harbor or, or in Ontario. Okay. But the problem I thought was like the land with the land comes all the regulation. No. Well, okay. Because we built, we've done and followed so many regulations according to a testing engineering testing lab, right. We used one called QAI. So they've certified the house. Okay. That means that we don't have to build it on a property to a point where the electrical inspector has to come in and do it because the, uh, you know, the body, the, the um, engineering body has actually in the certification lab has said, no, no, they're good. They followed everything. They're okay. really good. So we can basically deliver a final product to the job site. Um, the issue is, is that no municipality will give a carte blanche. Yes, you're approved 100% for everything because I don't know if there's a covenant on your property. I don't know if, it's a, if there's a, like, um, like, you know, for example, like a, a pathway, um, uh, you know, like a stream, a protected ham salmon habitat stream running through your property. Okay, you I probably don't have any of those in Ontario, but okay. Or whatever it happens to be, you know, like, yeah. is there a right of way or is there something there that prevents, and that's why, there's always something on a per job site that has to actually be looked at and considered. Now, what you're talking about is to buy a huge la like uh, piece of land and develop a whole community. Actually, very good and plausible. We're not financially set to do that. What our, our push now is to buy a few properties, build them and sell them because you have a legitimate PID and a transfer something that is like registered with land titles now people can buy it and that's the ultimate you know, decider of the market. It's like, I bought the property, put the unit on there, put two or three units on there and I put it to the marketplace and I don't have to sell it for 450. I could sell it for 650 a square foot sure. and see if the market will buy it. And if they buy it because of our quality and because of you know, what we did to develop the property, then so be it. And that's ultimately where we're going with this because awesome. talking in circles with people is just ridiculous. It's there, nobody puts the money up. And so sure. right now we're so close to, we can produce the units. We're like, screw it. We're just going to buy the properties now because I don't yeah, have to ask makes, somebody to buy yeah. the property. I just buy yeah, the so, property, so you, build the thing. Off. So yeah, a lot of times you, you actually end up vertically integrating like Ford Motor Company did this. They end up buying like everything. And then yeah. that's what you have to do to make a market work. You have to like, just yeah. buy up the whole thing. And then only afterwards, can you start to disaggregate it and say like, yeah. well, now that we figured this out, you know, it turns out someone else can buy the land and then we can sell them these units. And like, cause if you wanted to like, if these are actually manufactured um, instead of like on-site construction kind of thing, then there is a model for manufacturing, which works really, really well. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. And like, it sounds like this can do it. It's just the, the um, whole thing hasn't been integrated yet. Yeah. And that needs to happen first before it can be disaggregated. It's kind of like Craigslist or something, right? Like you remember Craigslist? Yeah. Yeah, it had all things sort of like had different things on there, like jobs and like for sale and this and that and the other, you know, dating things, you know, help wanted, like whatever it was, it was just a big list of stuff. And then yeah. so that was great. It was like one platform. And then since then, it got disaggregated. And now like all these things are all different websites. And they, and so they've gone like Kijiji or what have you, whatever. And yeah. ED, like what, and like that, that's sort of what happens with these things. They sort of move yeah. forward through aggregation and disaggregation. So you yeah. guys are in the okay. aggregation phase, like, okay, let's make yeah. this simple and easy, you know, which definitely for the consumer, the consumer just wants something simple and easy. Like Apple does this with everything they do. They just, you know, it just works. Um, but then behind the scenes, like you can have it as complicated as you want, so long as the, you know, the end user who's using it doesn't have to figure out like all kinds of 
complicated, crazy stuff that is worse yeah. than having to pay money, right? So they just have to walk into the thing and say, I'd like to live here. That's all. Yeah. That's what we yeah. want, you know, yeah. because it's like, oh man, it's just, it's uh Yeah. So yeah, like, I think, I think, yeah, you've got some, so we should like figure out how to sort of line all this up with like, you know, doing, just keep doing what you're doing. And then you use that as sort of a proof of concept. And then you can like take that in a few different directions. One is like selling this at full price, really high end, like find really expensive, like property, put yeah. these on there. And then it's like, okay, great. And people can pull, pay full freight and you can make a ton of money off that. And then also look at the other side of the market. It's like, okay, how do we do something that's like housing for everybody that's mm. nice but in a budget they can afford. Because if you try to make cheap housing for people and it's like shoddy and crappy and stuff, like yeah. that's just dumb. People don't want to live in crappy housing. They actually want something nice. So you just need to find a way to like make that work within like yeah. Ikea sort of does a good job of this, right? You go to Ikea and the stuff's not like the best in the world, but it's also not like God awfully terrible, right? Like I've got a bunch yeah. of stuff from Ikea that's lasted years or whatever. It works. There's, there's yeah, it's funky, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's made. You know, a lot of it's sort of you build it yourself or whatever. So you know, a bit different with like a house. Maybe you don't build it all yourself. Whatever. Um, but yeah, no, I think there's something here. I think this is really, really interesting stuff. And I guess I'm really curious about like what do you think you'd need to sort of move it forward? Like, what are the people you need to connect to? Like, how like, you know. Well, I think from an investment standpoint, let's look at it. There's so many different ways, but from an investment standpoint, you know, like we're good, you know, we're, we're actually a great partner to be involved with. And the, the, the ideal investor for me is just somebody that's saying, I want to put some money up. I want to buy the property and, you know, I'll go halfers on the construction costs with you and we'll treat it as much like real estate is the best investment. I got a, I got a six month mm. turnaround in producing a property. So I'm sitting here as a builder saying, I'll, I'll put my money in to build the property. Okay. I'll put, okay. I'll say half of the money to put the, to build the property. Okay. Um, and we're looking for an investor to come up with the value of the property. So if it's a $300,000 property, great. If it's a million dollar property, great. If it's 10, $300,000 properties, great. We can produce it. So you can property that is available right now at fair market value. So would and they we'll put half a yeah. million dollars of or plus of a real asset on that property and okay. that's the investor i'm looking for because i'm super... so that's a that's a developer then no well yeah so we're looking for partners in the development in, in okay. the okay so then the developer yeah. would they own it and then it would be a rental or would they then turn it around and sell it to like a homeowner type thing well typically what we're going to do is like um the big companies, what they do, they'll set, they'll start up a new numbered corporation to say this development is this numbered corporation, and we build it to a point, and then we sell it, and then it gets dispersed. Okay, fair enough. So sorry, you're you're selling it to individual homeowners, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, Just put okay, it on the market; okay. it'll go on to MLS. Okay, now, okay. if it doesn't sell or doesn't sell for, um, you know, the price that we're looking for, um, you know, you, you can always rent the things. And so that comes into the decision about where to look for the the the, the real estate. So for um, uh, VGH or the Vancouver or Victoria General Hospital, these are always really really great places to buy a property, um, and especially if there's some like housing stock on the market that's old, you can tear that down, put these there, and then if you still if if somehow the market takes a bit of a mm -hmm. you know a wonky step, we can say it's still in a premium area for like premium rental rentals, right? So you mm, could say, okay. all right, investor, let, what do you want to do, right? There's not a whole pool of investors. We say, you know, there's an investor who says, I'll, I'll buy one of these properties and I'll, you know, stick. Yeah, so you have a few players in there. Right? So, so you're, the, you're the constructor and then you have, exactly, the, yeah. you have the developer who's yeah. going to go and they're going to come up with this plan. And then you have the financing from the bank or whoever, right? Yeah. And then you might have equity financing in there from somebody or whatever. So there's a whole, like a lot of this that comes in. So like, I guess it's just a question of packaging this, this thing up and seeing sort of where that fits in comparison to like what else is available, right? Like what are developers doing? Are they already building things they're making great margins on? Like, does this give them a better margin in some way? Or is, does this meet a consumer? Like maybe there's consumers out there who aren't happy with all the options available and what you'd have would be the sort of thing they're looking for. And then you can kind of, and this is the tricky part, now you have to get that consumer looking for your brand and then you're like yeah. pulling it through the market kind of thing. 
And that's yeah. kind of your point with the Tesla. You actually have to have some room in your budget for doing that. So yeah. there, there's ways to that probably finding the right strategic partners makes sense with there's probably developers out there who are more sort of ecologically, you know, friendly and so on and so forth. You know, there's probably like credit unions that will do some financing and stuff like that. Like you probably just need to build sort of those pieces together. Um, maybe there's some way to get some sort of concessions from municipalities or some somewhere where like the thing you're doing aligns with what they want to do anyway. Like, I yeah. guess one of the things I would sort of wonder would be in terms of density. Like if the thing you're producing is low density, then it's kind of like, well, you know, there might be a preference for high density in some places. So you'd have to find that niche for like, this makes sense for a low density thing. Well, this is, uh, I'll show you this other one here too. It's called uh, a brochure. It's a brochure that I, I designed here. So um, show and tell. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. How do I share that again here? Um, okay. Shoot. I do have to run in a few minutes, but okay. Let's see. Oh, wow. That's nice. Yeah. So this is, this is the, um, this is the other unit cool. and, and what these do is they actually go in for secondary suites to help exactly what you're talking about, um, high density shorting, uh, housing mm. shortfalls. So this would go in a backyard where you could offer a thousand square foot home and you could offer it as, right? So one thing I noticed uh, just in my local area, the high school has a lot of land attached to it. Some of it's yeah. like a football field and stuff, but there's also like just like, open grass areas that like are basically not used for anything now that's not to say that that's perfect for like throwing a single family home in there and stuff like that but it would make sense for something i, I don't know what but like maybe you can't have a car because it's not exactly like roadway accessible and stuff because like the well, back of like a high school or something maybe that's a completely bonkers idea yeah, 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 yeah um no no this is i mean the, the reason why i think that um you know being a steel structure, like you pointed out earlier, these mm. things can be used for like a commercial application as well. It doesn't, you know, like you could. Oh, that sounds interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So yeah. there's, there's a lot of things that can spur out from this um, because um, it just is. Uh, I mean, the other units can actually be used and stacked uh, and used as a multifamily project. Potential oh, wow. with this company that, it, you know, we can go. Um, you know, seven different directions and develop seven, di seven different markets. And they're all huge markets. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's, it's like, you know, we're stuck on which way to move. Like, you know, you say you can, you're navigating, you know, one through 1000, we're on step three and then yeah, four yeah, and then five. Yeah, and we, yeah. it's about choosing the right step well, or, to move. Or letting the market choose. Like if you go and you explore all seven different things you can do in like a low cost way, right? Like you can, create mock-ups and things like you can, you know, do the design and the brochures and show people and gather some interest and stuff instead of like actually building, you know, the actual thing and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars that you can kind of like, and then sort of go out to the market and just sort of see where people are at and what the price points are and stuff like that. Then like, that might be one way of sort of gauging, yeah. like, you know, are people willing, because the, the thing using it for business sounds sort of fascinating. And that's the kind of yeah. thing where like, maybe it makes sense to go for people who've got, you know, a, decent sized property and a reasonable amount of wealth and like it would be you know they have a home office but the home office that's inside their main house maybe is problematic it's actually better to have something that you walk 10 20 steps to and that's mm -hmm. your office and then yeah. you go off to the office and you're not distracted by everything all the noises in your house and you just work in this little you know it's like a nice building you're there and maybe you can have some you know people come like if you're running a business and you can have like four or five people working there whatever and then mm -hmm. it's like now it's not just like you're trying to run your business out of your home office it's like yeah it's like sort of like home-ish kind of office yeah. right because I think there's especially the pandemic and everything there's a lot of um people who like like I like the working from home thing you know it works reasonably well yeah sometimes it would be nice to have something just a little removed from my actual sort of basement and stuff where it's like, you know, and then you do have that separation of like, you, you know, you walk a few steps and you're now in this other building and that's your office. Yeah. And then maybe at lunchtime, you come back to your house and you have a proper lunch and you go for a walk or whatever. And then you go back to the office in the end, you know, five o'clock or whatever comes and then you leave and you go back home and you're good. And you're like, oh, you know, I left everything at the office. So it sort of provides, but that's, 
a very niche market for people who have enough land to do that. I certainly don't. And then enough money to do that, you know. And so, but given the number of people in Canada, it's 30 million people in Canada. How big is that market? Yeah, uh, that's right. That's I don't right. know, and, but it's and, something. And and we're on the coast. So there's we're used to a lot of like especially custom builders because you know we don't have the track builders. We don't have the big huge we do a little bit, but we don't mm-hmm. most of them are actually focused on towers, right? Right, because right. we have a lot of interesting terrain and rivers and stuff to kind of go through. We have a lot of custom builders. Yeah. And yeah. and so we have a lot of architect projects, right? And these are the kinds of places where you can use them as auxiliary buildings for either, you know, uh, you know, for people that are um, you know, homeowners or for small businesses or whatever. But anyways, yeah. I didn't mean to dominate the whole thing. No, I it sounds that, amazing. I love it. It's it's really, really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna do an active way to try and make it subtly partnership because I would love to be able to get um you know, you know, as much attention to it as possible. I think this is one of the ways that I'm I'm trying to bridge doing the right thing, um, you know, doing something uh, you know good for my community and something that's healthy for my family financially. Yeah, and yeah, well, if you're if you're an yeah. accredited investor, join Impact United, and then you can get in on all these conversations that a ton of people are having about solving the problem that you have a solution for. And it's maybe not an accredited investor. What does that mean? Oh, okay. So there's like three, basically there's three tests. Um, So it's an income test, an asset test, or a financial knowledge test. So in the province of Ontario, it's something like $200,000 in income annually yourself or 300,000 with a spouse. An asset test is either a million dollars of financial assets with your spouse net of um, liabilities or whatever, or 5 million, including your house kind of thing. And then the third one, the financial knowledge one, is basically some sort of level of the CFA, Chartered Financial um, Analyst thing. I'm not sure which level or whatever. So that's sort of the rough sketch. It might be different in BC. I'm not sure if that's like a provincial thing or a national thing, actually, because it's super confusing the way the regulations work. But the basic concept is the government doesn't want you as just a regular middle class person to be able to go invest your life savings in something that's kind of like maybe a bit too risky. And so they put these, you know, kind of regulations in there to sort of say like, oh, to do risky investment, you have to actually sort of know what you're doing or have the capacity to absorb the losses kind of thing. So it's kind of a bit sort of silly and artificial. The other thing about it is even if like probably a lot of people qualify as accredited investors, like the vast majority of them probably do absolutely nothing with it. Because even if they have a great income, like doctors probably, most doctors probably qualify, you know, people own expensive houses or have a big, you know, stock market portfolio. Like it's, you know, daunting to go out and try to like make sense of like, you know, doing things like, you know, angel investing is, is sort of the thing that you can do. That's, so that's sort of my interest with it. And so like, for me, that sort of means that, you know, it's possible to get involved in angel investing groups and then sort of learn before, you know, just going in and like dumping a bunch of money on something I don't understand, right? Because my, my main thing is like, I, I'm really, really happy to do stupid things unless it involves like loss of life or limb. Money. Yeah. And or yeah, like huge... big amounts of money or taking on like legal liability that I'm not clear yeah. about, right? You know, so it's like, other than that, if it's just like look, being embarrassed, like, sure, I'll, I'll do stupid things and be embarrassed all day long. That's fine. That's how you learn and grow. Well, what would it take to put together a group of people that just wanted to invest in property? I mean, I, like I'm, I'm the guy that's saying it's the most, um, like it, it's the most valuable asset to have according to yeah, a yeah. bank, right? I mean, yeah, if I own yeah. this property and it's worth a million dollars, then, you know, like it's, yeah, it's not yeah. like I'm getting somebody to invest in a company and they're going to spend, you know, like your dollars are going to go to my company overhead. I'm saying it has none, nothing to do with that. Yeah, like a hundred percent of your dollars, not yours particular, but if we, if we brought a group of people that were invested in property development, then they can put their money. We can be the builder to put them on the properties. Yeah, and I'm even saying I'll even put money into that. So it's not just, yeah, and, cool, and we can right? layer in property technology with this too, right? Like this, yeah. this is where like getting a group of people together and making some sort of amazing combination of things works. Well, I okay. actually do have to run. But okay. let's pick this up next week and talk about that because it's a great idea to like not just be an entrepreneur on your own. 
to actually yeah. work with a bunch of other people and then align interests and everybody has a share of the pie, then yeah. you're all going to have the interest you know, reason to work together. There's still egos and things like that to work out. And, but you know, we'll talk and we'll figure out like our great master plan for making your Bafama homes or whatever it is that they raise up and down and they're making it amazing and successful because why not <laughs> well and and we could do lots with this show as well i realize that the arts don't have a ton of money and you know you have to try and think how are we going to promote this how are we going to you know build this uh you know to a point where you know we're being invited on joe rogan that's the goal yeah. well yeah let's, let's talk <laughs> let's talk about how to make everybody a ton of money because that that's actually something we should you know talk more about because people are too sort of embarrassed to talk about yeah. it. But yeah. you might as well go through and like, I like to talk about stupid, dumb things that I've done. Like I worked at Nortel and they went bankrupt, right? Like, yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, I invested in Nortel. I invested in JD Uniphase. I invested in Commerce One and Ariba. Ariba didn't go bankrupt. They got bought by SAP, but yeah, still yeah, lost a lot that. of money on that. But whatever, you know, you only, you only learn by doing stupid things. Anyway, I better go have some dinner, but okay. this has been awesome and amazing. Okay. We will talk again next week. Thanks, Alex. Bye. All right. Thank you.